Welcome back to the Too Dumb to Quit podcast with Jeremy McCall. Very talented, god awful ugly. <laughs> <laughs> So my guest today, dear friend, amazing man, uh, you, you people are going to be blown away today by the story that you're going to hear from my friend Robin Majors. Robin! <laughs> What's up, dude? Blown away. Hey, my brother. I'm doing great. You're home off the road, huh? Home off the road for a little. So are you. Yeah, I am. You've had a little time. I did. Yeah. Which is awesome. So for those of you that don't know... Uh, when I, I first met Robin Majors in, I was like 17 years old, at a club that I own now. Uh, it used to be called Kelly's in State Line. And I think Robin came through there. Uh, he's a tour manager, which we're going to have him explain what that means to people outside of the industry. But um, he was a tour manager for John Barry. Were you through that Kelly's we with John Barry? I was wondering if it was... I John Barry, or month, it wasn't control. Highway 101. It had to no. be John Barry. Or Montgomery <clears throat> Gentry. No, I think it was the first time, I'm pretty sure. It was John Barry. It was John Barry. But we did play it with Black Hawk also. Yeah. <clears throat> I remember. Yes. Because I think uh, that was the first time I'd played it in the winter, and we had the back closed. <laughs> it's winter there right now. <laughs> yeah. It's 98 degrees in Nashville, and it is three feet of snow on the top of Montana Passes. <laughs> it's crazy, man. Yeah, so, so we played that uh, little club Kelly's, and yeah. God, Kelly was a great guy, too. Yes. I'm so glad you own that place now. Yeah. I'm glad it's the tradition's carrying on. It's amazing. And it's just <laughs> turned into kind of what it was in the old days. Um uh, it's packed every weekend. The acts that are coming through are all really good quality, and um, and the crowds are eating it up. You know, it's you've had really, it what really about five years five now? Five years this month, yeah. Oh, five right. year anniversary this right month. Oh man, it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. So when so, I first got my gig as a tour manager with Larry the Cable Guy, I didn't even know what that meant. I was like <laughs> twenty three years old. Yeah. And I had had Robin's number through the radio or whatever with Maybe Eddie and Wicks. Troy and Wix. Maybe. Yeah. And uh, met up with you. And there were two guys that I would call incessantly with questions. Uh, you and Pootie Locke. <laughs> from, uh, I'm honored to be in that. <laughs> yeah, because Pootie and I go back to 1977 probably. Wow. And yeah. Pootie was with Willie Nelson for... 30, Forever. 40 years. Yeah, yeah, until he passed. Yeah. Um, so take us through. You grew up in the Carolinas? I got me to tell the story first. Okay. <laughs> take me through this. How this all starts. How Robin I'm Majors got his start. I'm going to start with Jeremy story. McComb first. This is a funny-ass story, in my opinion. Uh, so you were working um, with Larry the Cable Guy. Right. I met you guys in a Florida show one time. Y'all came in at, a, I believe, around... Uh, I think it was around Orlando. You and Larry showed yeah. up, and Larry really didn't have—he didn't have anything going on that much yet. No, it hadn't happened yet. Uh, that yeah. that the for, the thing that they did with Fox, the yeah, TV Collar. show, yeah, yeah, that that hadn't happened yet. Right. And so here's Jeremy, a tour manager with a comedian, and we had as our Jim Beam rep, who used to be our record label rep, Wix Wickman. Right. And Wix was trying his best to be a comedian. Yeah, okay. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, after the tour that year, you come, uh, Wix called and said, hey, I'm going to do this USO thing with me and Jeremy. Yeah. I'm thinking y'all are going over and tour. doing some comedy stuff. <laughs> okay, so I started my career with Marshall Tucker Band. And uh, my first road manager gig was with um, Highway 101. And the two booking agents that were at Monterey Artists at the time, the agency that books acts, uh, was Bobby Cudd and right. Steve Dahl. Right. And they took me under their wing and taught me how to do things. Well, Bobby Cudd was from Spartanburg, South Carolina. Correct. And he had been telling me, I've got this kid you've got to see. And this was like three years ago. Paul Riddle, the drummer for Marshall Tucker, is doing the production is is his producer you got to hear this kid so this was like 
goes like three years. I mean, this happened. Then the, we met you guys, and then you and Wicks do this tour. Yeah. And then Bobby calls me out of the blue. This is like three years later, and said, "Hey, Paul's in town, and that kid's playing tonight." Uh, and so I said, "Great, man, I'll be there." Yeah. Walk in. There's Paul Riddle. There's a band set up. Here's Jeremy McComb as the artist. <laughs> I'm thinking he's a comedian. I had no idea you played music. I... <laughs> that was so funny. That's one of my favorites. Because that but, night I remember, like, you walked in and you were like, Jeremy, what are you doing here? And I go, I'm playing. Yeah. Tonight? Yeah. I didn't know you did music. I thought you were a fucking comedian. Uh, that's yeah. great. That that's just one of my favorite stories, and then blew me away. And and no, unbeknownst to everybody out there listening right now, we just called Paul Riddle, yeah, and talked to him for a couple of minutes. Yes. The Marshall Tucker Band. I started with them in 1977 as uh, a third man on an audio crew, wow. um, because I shot a staple in my hand, and they had to hire me. The sound company had to hire me, or I, I was going to sue them. Sue them? <laughs> that's what they thought. Had you ever been on the road before that? No, I quit college to go to work with this band out of Knoxville called Rich Mountain Tower, which is another interesting story. I, I don't know how long your podcast is. We got is. time. We got all the time you want. Well, I was going to college at Motlow. I'm from Tullahoma, Tennessee. Okay. And uh, I was going to college at Motlow, and uh, there was a band out of Knoxville, uh, University of Tennessee uh, Pickers, and... Um, they had a little band called Rich Mountain Tower, had a deal on Atlantic Record. Well, the guitar player was from Tullahoma, and he said, hey, we're getting a band back together. And I was I was over college, and uh, he said, uh, do you want to come with me and, and come to, uh, I've got to go to Key West and get this book this gig. So the long story short, I ended up working for Mountain Sound. Uh, instead of Rich Mountain Tower. Which was like the production company. Which was a production company, okay. yeah. And uh, they hired me to, to go out on the road with Marshall Tucker Band. I'd never been on the road whatsoever. Wow. But the, the story about Rich Mountain Tower, they were, uh, the drummer was from New York, and he, there was some money behind him. Mm. Uh, Bob Tassillo. Uh I don't know where the money came from, but his name was Tassillo. <laughs> <laughs> we don't ask questions. We don't ask questions. <laughs> So uh, they built their own little sound system. And back in those days, back in the, in the 70s, regional acts would have the, uh, the sound system and national acts would come through. They weren't carrying production yet. Right. So they would use the opening acts stuff. Well, Charlie Daniels came through and used Rich Mountain Tower stuff and said, we love this stuff. Can you build us a sound system? We're getting ready to do a national act. And they said, well, it'll be about $50,000. And they said, okay. Charlie said, sure, let's build it. Yeah. Um, actually, it was Joe Sullivan, the manager at the time. Yeah. So they built that. And then Marshall Tucker did a show with Mar or with Charlie, saw his stuff, and said, man, we love this stuff. Can you build us a sound system? We won't double the size. They said, well, it'll be $100,000. So Rich Mountain Tower became Mountain Sound in Knoxville. Wow. And that's the way that that happened. That's amazing. Totally. And it, it didn't ever happen today, but right. but that's the way it happened in the in the mid-70s. That's 70s. unbelievable. Yeah. So the drummer was out with Marshall Tucker when this went down with David Carr and said, uh, Tassillo said, hey, man, I want to go back out on the road. I got this kid. I think he'll be great out here. And seven years later... Uh, I, I went to work for 38 Special because Toy Caldwell, Paul Riddle, and George McCorkle quit the band that day. So we'd with already Marshall lost Tucker. Tommy with Marshall Tucker. Yeah. So I went out with 38 Special, but I spent seven years with Marshall Tucker at that point. So your first gig is with Marshall <laughs> with Tucker, Marshall Tucker band. band. Cool. And when like, Southern Rock said it's, it was peak. king. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, everybody knows that, um, for those of you who, who don't know the music business or maybe not into the Southern Rock thing, the Caldwell brothers are a work study in Southern Rock. I mean, people still talk about Toy Caldwell being one of the godfathers of that Southern Rock sound. I mean, it was Southern Rock. You it know? was the, you know, there was there were so many great acts, and we played with all of them. Yeah. It was so much fun. The Almond brothers were the blues part. We were the jazz part, more yeah. or less. 
along with uh, the Dixie Dregs and a couple other acts like that. And then, of course, Charlie was right in your face with right. his syncopated moves that they did and all the changes they do in their music, almost jazz itself. And uh, then uh, Jimmy Hall was, uh, uh, Wet Willie and those guys yeah, were man. a different part of Southern Rock, but it was all the same. Little Feet was in the mix. Right. They were California boys, but gosh, Lowell George writing the stuff he did. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we played with all those guys. Louisiana, LaRue, Climax Blues Band, um, uh, the Dixie Dregs, uh, Grinder Switch. Uh, Grinder Black Switch. Oak, Arkansas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've written with... Uh, <laughs> With uh, uh, oh man, what was it? The Ozark Mountain Daredevils. Yeah, like, Jim Dandy. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> Soup Du Jour, right? Is it Soup or whatever his name? Is. Um, so you leave Marshall Tucker in what is that? Eighty three. Eighty three. The end of eighty three. We 83, did our last show. So Tommy Caldwell had passed. He passed in nineteen eighty. Yeah. He had a Jeep wreck. We had just finished. We were just on tour. We had just started the tour. Uh, I can't remember the album that was out at the time, but we had just done two shows at Long Island's Nassau Coliseum. Mm. And uh, the second one, we got home and got the news that Tommy had flew home and had a Jeep wreck that morning. Oh. And he passed away six days later. So, But we carried on. You know, we, we yeah. hired uh, uh, Franklin Wilkie, who was in this great band out of Greenville, South Carolina, called, uh, gosh, what was the name of their band? Um, I can't remember. It had come to me in a minute. Yeah. But uh, we also hired a, another great writer and uh, piano player, a blind piano player named Ronnie Godfrey. Uh, oh, Garfield Ruff was the name of their... <laughs> Garfield Ruff. <laughs> yeah, was the name of the band over in uh, Greenville at the time. And both of them came from that, and so uh, we carried on without Tommy for about three years. Yeah. And then Toy, Toy and Paul and uh, uh, hung it up. Yeah. yeah. Did... Um when you were doing that, I mean, how does how does that conversation start of, like, you're running sound, but, I mean, you don't have any experience on the road. Well, I was third man audio, so I was setting it up. Um, the uh, two engineers, uh, a guy named Randy Day, and another night, a guy named John Williams, and I have no idea where John's at these days when he finally left. I haven't seen him since that day. He's like that cat in Animal House that drives off with a car. <laughs> right. you know, it's unknown. You don't know where the hell he's at. Right. Uh, he's kind of like that cat. But uh, they they just kind of started showing me, and I started mixing opening acts. Yeah. And I started reading all the books around the office and, you know, the Altec, the stuff that was out at the time, and just learning. And then I would sit in the, in the warehouse and... Uh, burn a big doobie, and I just sit there and play with the uh, <laughs> the equalizers, and make right. make things ring to learn those tones. Right, you know, just where you could catch it, and uh, just within eight months, that John left, and I started mixing the opening acts all the time. Wow! And within a year, uh, about a year and a month or two, some fourteenth months or something like that. Uh, Blackie started mixing. He was their monitor engineer. He started doing lights again. He owned the lighting company, and I started mixing monitors for Tucker. Unreal. So, yeah. What was an average day? I mean, it, has it changed a lot? Oh yeah. You know, the big tour then we were playing. Uh, we were playing the arenas that people still play now, uh, but we were doing it in three trucks. Uh, my current job, we have 17 semis out there playing those very same arenas. So uh, nobody was hanging stuff in the air at the time. We were putting things up on uh, what you call vermette legs or genies and right. uh, putting them up, putting the lights up in the air. We were just putting our sound down on the on the, on the floor. On the floor and on the sound wings, at least. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we started flying it soon thereafter. Uh, about 1980, we started flying things in the air, so we hired a rigger right. that would do the points, and, and uh, it's changed tremendously. That was a big tour then, three trucks. But our three trucks were packed from the top to the bottom wow. with band gear, merchandise, and everything else. Everything rolls in these days. Right. Everything is, has been, and everything weighs a lot less, too. We were using oh, yeah. steel then. Uh, and par 64 cans and now you have moving lights and now you have video that you can actually make it work you know right. instant replay didn't come along till 1967 or something like that so, so crazy. you know the technology has grown so much 
So, yeah. So, um, this is Robin Majors, and you would be hard-pressed to find anybody more knowledgeable about the music business when it comes to touring and uh, in the business really overall. Um, you're one of the guys. So, there's a, there's a thing in... Uh, in kind of this life philosophy I've been living called a plus, an equal, and a minus in your life, right? That you always need somebody who's way better, way above you, to keep you in line, to keep you humble, to keep you in check. I you agree need somebody to that. equal to you, you know, to compete with um, or to bounce things off of and make each other better. And then you need people, someone below you who you can teach the things you are learning. We pull it to. forward. Yes. And you have always been my plus. Oh, man. Thank you, you for saying uh, that, bro. You have so much knowledge. I'm, I've been intimidated, not intimidated in a bad way, but it's like I'm in awe of your knowledge of the business and the people and, and the way that you conduct yourself and the way you do business and the way you act as a human being. And, and it's just an amazing thing to know you. And your knowledge of this business is crazy. So going from the Marsh Tucker Band, your next gig is it is that your first time tour managing no no uh, um i went from marshall tucker uh a company out of new york was doing our merchandise okay. at first uh again we had a, a t-shirt company out of macon georgia everything was out of georgia at the time sure. but a deal came along there was this uh, i'm sure a lot of people out there remember in the early 70s and through the 80s there was a company called rock bill and rock bill would put out those little fold they'd just hand them out at gigs okay and you would take it home and it'd have something about the band and they were just advertising stuff well they were, were a merchandise company hmm. and t-shirt company and they were our t-shirt company with tucker the way it went down with tucker i don't, I, I hate to say this right. because it was it Paul Riddle and Toy Caldwell knew that they were quitting. And what had come down to us, the crew guys, we were going to take six months off. Oh. And so I found another gig. I just had my first child. Uh, Anna was born in uh, April. In December of 83, we were going to take off for six months. So I took a gig with on the 38 Special Tour working with the T-shirts company, okay. Brockham. And... Um, I went to Paul first and Toy together, actually, and I said, hey, man, this is my last night. And Paul's the one that turned to me, looked at Toy, and said, hey, this is our last this night, is too. everybody's last <laughs> night, yeah. But that wasn't the case. Marshall Tucker's still out there working. Sure, Doug sure. Gray carried it on, and Jerry stuck with the band at that time also. Yeah. Uh, and they went out as Marshall Tucker, and they're still killing it, in my yeah. opinion. Uh, there's a lot of fans that love that old, that type of music, and I'm one of them. Yeah. Uh, uh, Doug Gray is, is was I was his axe for seven years, man, and so you got to see how tight we got, and right. it, it hurt to leave that family. But I had a new family uh, of my own, right. and I had to do something. So I went to work for Brockham. I did the Thirty Eight Special Tour. Uh, I learned a lot. What I what I really learned from that, though was finances and dealing with people in the building. I was having to advance shows with uh, how many booths and tables and uh, the percentages and having to do settlements at the end of the night with them. Mm -hmm. So that carried over when I became a tour manager. I had some financial experience. Yeah. So that, you know, was a stepping stone to becoming a tour manager if you look back at it and with that retrospect, right. in my opinion. Uh, I did the 38. I did that for about five years. Uh, I did 38 special. I did the Jackson Victory tour. Uh, I was out with. Um, oh gosh. Jackson Victory tour was Michael Jackson. It was the Jackson brothers. It was Jackson Five, more or less. Oh my! But Randy was out there also. So this was '84, and and 38 special was finishing up their 110 shows, and they said, "Hey, we want Robin back to finish the tour." So they grabbed me back. But I I trained. We had seven people, and I trained a couple of people out for Brockham for that. And then it became. Uh, I quit. The, I tried my best to get off the road, but you know how the money you make and the bills you make for yourself it doesn't always sure you can't make it work so i worked 10 in and i got my union card 
in Nashville. I moved to Nashville, and I, I worked for IATSE, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Right. And I got my union card, and I started working at TNN. I was on Nashville Now. I was audio guy on really? there for a while. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. And uh, Mil McDaniels come, so. <laughs> Mel McDaniels came through and needed a tour manager. And a lot of people were Mel's tour managers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I took that gig and went back on the road for about nine weeks. I think I got fired three times and quit twice uh, in nine weeks. <laughs> is that hard to deal with? It was one of those things that it, some days it was, um, if his wife was out there, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> Let's uh, just leave it right there. Yeah, it gives you a little, <laughs> a little check. <laughs> yeah, I, so, Kelly. so I came back home and uh, I went right back to the union work. Yeah. And uh, how, it's funny, Highway 101 was just coming along, and they were on the CMAs that year as the new group. They had been in the Hank video. Oh. And I was assigned to that cart all day. Uh, so I was dealing with Cactus Moser all day long, the drummer for Highway 101. Right. And as we kept talking, he said, hey, man, we need a tour manager. And I said, I tried that with Mel McDaniels. I don't ever want to do that <laughs> shit again. <laughs> <laughs> So I said, if you need an audio guy, I'm your guy. Right. December comes along. This is in October. December comes along of 87, and Brockham calls and says, hey, we got our first country act, and it's a group called Highway 101. And Chuck Morris uh, was was the manager for them. And Chuck, I, I'd worked with Chuck out in Denver. Barry Fay was the big promoter in Denver area at the time, and he did Red Rocks and McNichols and all wow. those places. And so uh, I took the gig with back with Brockham and went out with Highway 101, and they had a guy named Jim Sider out there. Jim Sider was the tour manager for the Birds. Whoa. <laughs> and he was rock and roll, and he was pissing off country promoters <laughs> left and right. Right. You know. Well, in, in the country music world, it's very much a good old boy network. It's, yeah. It's your friends. It's how you've treated people in the past, and rock and roll guys are like, yeah, fuck them if on, they don't like it. If you're good <laughs> on the way up, you can work for them on the way down. Right. And if you don't, you're shit out of luck. Yeah. You know, basically. Right. So I got out with Highway 101, and... Um, they weren't doing that good a business yet. They just had, they were on their second single. Mm. And uh, Brockham said, hey, we got to pull you off that. We just can't pay you that kind of money and be out there. And uh, we're going to put you out with this group called, uh, they're opening for Iron Maiden, a group called Guns N' Roses. No way. <laughs> you were out with Guns N' Roses too? I was. We were all on one bus. I've known you 20 years. <laughs> I didn't know that. You're on one bus with one Guns N' Roses. with Guns N' Roses. We had a 22-foot box truck that the merch rode in with the equipment. Holy we were opening for Iron Maiden. shit. This was 87. Uh, and this, this was the first of 88. So I was out with them, and uh, they only had two crew guys. And every third night, somebody had to drive the truck. Okay. Or somebody different. And it just got, I mean, these guys were brand new. They were having fun. Oh. I had done that in the 70s. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I just started driving the truck every night, basically. It, what the hell? You just, uh, I just, yeah. The, the party. I, well, yeah, they, they were up quite late. I bet. Yeah. So anyway. Um, Who was, I mean, was Sla like the Slash thing? The, how, what was that dynamic of Slash and Axel and? I, I, I had very little to do with them. You didn't, All right. Because uh, they would come in and go straight to the back room, <clears throat> and I wasn't hanging around in back rooms anymore. Right. <clears throat> so <laughs> I don't know what they were doing, and I don't care what they were doing, but I know that the music was blasting until about 6 a.m. I bet. And, and uh, that was that. Damn. And in the middle of the whole deal, and I'll tell you, I'll give you a slash story here in a second, but in the middle of the whole deal... Uh, Highway 101 Cactus called and said Hey Jim Siders quit We need a tour manager Would you reconsider I called Brockham and I said Hey I can get out there with 101 Do their merch If you'll let me double dip And I'm going to be their tour manager Yeah And I ended up being their audio engineer too So I was I was tritextual instead of bitextual Oh my gosh <laughs> Tritextual <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I, I went to I went to Slash because he was a 
Les Paul slinging guitar playing motherfucker, man. Yeah. I went to Slash, and he had his glasses on. I said, man, this is my last night. I want to tell you, I've really enjoyed your picking. You remind me of Toy Caldwell yeah. playing that Les Paul. And he put his glasses up above his eyes, and he said, who the fuck are you? <laughs> Swear to God. I'd been on his bus for nine weeks. <laughs> so I think I made the right decision. I, don't I think so. <laughs> yeah. Who the fuck are you? I can't imagine the amount of shit going on early on in that Guns N' Roses. Oh, well, you know what was fascinating? Iron Maiden was doing great business. And you look at the the numbers and merchandise, you look at per head. If they were doing 10,000 people a head, you did $40,000 a merch, you're doing four bucks a head. Yeah. I got out there, Guns N' Roses was doing 50 cents a head. Uh, Iron Maiden was doing four bucks a head. Wow. We started doing a buck a head, and Appetite for Destruction just took off. Pretty soon we were doing two bucks a head. And I watched the same thing, that same uh, dynamic happening with uh, when I was out with 38 Special. Huey Lewis was the opening act, and one a new drug had just hit. And Damn. they were doing 50 cents a head, yeah. and pretty soon they were doing a buck a head. We were doing three bucks a head. They were doing two bucks a head. Pretty soon we were even doing two fifty each, you know. Right. That, that kind of. It, there's only so much money they're going to spend every night. Sure. So uh, yeah, it was that same little dynamic. That's Guns and Roses took off with the merch. Fucking unreal. Yeah. And the fact that that whole thing happened based on like one video mm-hmm. spin on MTV at four in the morning. Yeah. They played fucking. Um, what was the big hit? Uh, shit. Sing it to me. <laughs> Where do, no, right? Where do, uh, oh, Where Welcome to the Jungle. Where does it go yeah. now? That's right. Where <laughs> do we go? Yeah. So Welcome to the Jungle hits at fucking 4 o'clock in the morning and explodes. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So you leave and go back to Highway 101. I did. I went back to Highway 101. I was their tour manager. A um, couple of interesting things happened during all that. Uh, you know, record sales at the time, uh, you would call when they did the Billboard Top 200, they would call the record labels, the local uh, r- record stores. Right. Say, how many did you sell this week? And they'd say, ah, I guess I sold six, eight. Well, they started doing Arbitron at that time, 1990, I believe it was. And at the time, when you look at the top 200 charts or the top 100 charts, whatever it was, of album sales, there were, I think, four albums of country music on the on the charts. Uh-huh. Probably Dwight, uh, right. uh, Randy Travis. Right. Garth wasn't out. Well, Garth had just started. So the week after they started Arbitron, there were 26 records on the on the top 100. Oh. And so L.A. and New York said, "What the fuck's going on in Nashville, man?" Right. That's kind of where the whole little that new wave started at that time. The hat when act they, started when they started the Arbitron rating system, rather than just on a Some telephone. Some guy going like, "Yeah, I think I sold six of them last right. time. I'm not sure." Right. Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of interesting. Wow. Yeah. But Highway 101 was uh, uh, Chuck Morse was their manager. He had Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, uh, Desert Rose Band. Uh, Lyle Lovett and uh, all of those are literally top ten favorites of mine. And uh, Big Head Todd and the Monsters. Really? Uh, yeah. And Leo Cocky. I mean, he had a qu- quite a, 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 a roster. A roster at the time. Yeah. yeah. So it was a lot of fun. We played a lot of those acts. But it was also Bobby Cudd and, and Monterey had just opened up their office in Nashville. Steve Dahl had moved from Tulsa to open that up. Country music took off right after that, wow. big time. The Hat Acts took off. So unbelievable. So when the big um, when the big swell of like Nashville started taking over, who were you with at that point? Where you would? Uh, so I you left, went like I, I, I went mean, from Highway 101. Uh, David Corlew, that manages Charlie Daniels, mm-hmm. called me and he had a new act uh, that Jimmy Bowen was uh, was working with called uh, John Barry, and that's who you and I for, yes. first met. Yeah, John should have been a the next Julio Iglesias in my he's opinion he had such this, a good singer such, still a great singer yeah he's got a Christmas show that people need to see I talked to him just recently and he told me that they're booked up for the whole winter for this Christmas show wow uh, I did that for about five years does he do a Nashville show 
I need uh, to go see it. Yeah, you need to go see I it. I need to go with you. It's in Gallatin is the last one that I saw. Okay. Yeah. No, it was in Lebanon. Yeah. He's, but he's going to do probably 40 shows this winter. Wow. Yeah. And it's, it's really good. Um, and so I did five years there, and then I went to work with Blackhawk. Yeah. Uh, Henry Paul and uh, those One of guys. The most underrated acts in country music still. They were doing great on radio at the time. Yeah. You know, they were at, on Atlantic Records and had a good staff over there, good uh, promotion team. And Blackhawk was kicking ass. Yeah. And the deal with John, he had brain surgery and then he had to have throat surgery. And again, I had two more babies and him and Gus had come along and it was time for me to, to move on. Yeah. Uh, so I went to work for Blackhawk for a little while and then. Uh, October of 1999, I got a call from Johnny Doris, and he said, hey, man, we need a tour manager for uh, uh, Montgomery Gentry. Yeah. Yeah. For Black... Uh, this, you got time for one more story? We talk, dude, we talk all damn day. <laughs> I love this. Johnny Doris called me, and, and I was bitexual. I, with, <laughs> <laughs> I was mixing house and tour managing for Blackhawk yeah. and John Barry and Highway 101. I was doing all of that. So when Johnny Doris called, uh, I was happy. We were having a blast out with Blackhawk. You can imagine with Henry Paul and the music, yeah. the crowds we were getting, the fans that they have. Radio hits. Radio hits. We were having a blast. So I shot my price way up, uh, about 20% more than I was making. Wow. Thinking, okay, i got to go mix. I don't really want to leave. I'm just going to throw it up. So I met with Johnny Doris, uh, the manager for them. Johnny's never heard this story. I went with them and um, uh, talked with him, told him what I had to have, and he said, man, you're asking a lot of money. I said, well, that's my nut. That's right. what I'm going to have to have. I said, who else you talking to? And he told me a guy's name. I said, uh, man, he's a great engineer, but I didn't know he tour managed. And he told me another name. I said, well, he's a great tour manager. Does he mix? Yeah. Just shit like that. And just kept talking. So he said, well, I walked out and thinking, okay, had a great conversation. I like Johnny a lot. Yeah. Didn't think I'd ever hear anything. A couple of weeks later, he called. He says, Eddie and Troy wants to meet you. I had met Eddie Montgomery. He was the merchandise guy with John Michael. Okay. He was out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was wide open like he still is. Yes, he, he is. He hadn't changed a bit since the day I met him. Mm. So I went to this meeting at the Longhorn, which was their office. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like a pizza place or yeah. some shit now. Yeah. So uh, Eddie starts asking me all these very pertinent questions. Troy's sitting over there with just rolling his head, rolling his eyes, wringing his hands. First thing Troy Gentry ever said to me was, you're asking too goddamn much money. <laughs> I looked at him. I said, well, man, that's my nut. I got to have it. Right. Walked out of there. Didn't think anything about it. Thought, okay. I'm happy. Well, yeah. Johnny Doris calls and says, hey, man, I see on your schedule you're off next weekend. The boys want you to ride down to Florida with them. They got two shows. I said, okay, I'll get on the bus. Yeah. Get on the bus, ride down there, uneventful. Troy Gentry's not talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> we get down to Florida. It's raining like hell. They cancel the show. Uh -oh. They start drinking. This is 10 o'clock in the morning. Jim Beam comes out. Jim Beam comes out. They didn't have a Jim Beam deal either. Yeah. Just to let everybody know, they took that Jim Beam deal. They weren't going to take any other deal because they were Jim Beam, they were Jim Kentucky Beam whiskey drinkers. Yeah. And they were Kentucky boys, and they were, that was going to be. Yeah. That's all they did. So, um, uh, Troy says, here, have a shot of Jim Beam. I says, no, man, I'll have a beer. He says, have a shot of whiskey. We drink whiskey on this bus. I said, dude, I quit drinking whiskey a long time ago when I quit a lot of other shit that they're doing on Guns N' Roses bus. <laughs> right. <laughs> I said, no, I'll have a beer. He turns to Johnny Dorsey and he says, we hired the wrong son of a bitch for this gig. I said, first, you ain't hired me yet. And second, I count you money every night. He looked at me real sly and he said, have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> So we do the whole weekend. They had the next show. We do the show. Uh, a guy named Pete McDonough's out there mixing uh, sound for him. And so I go to we get home, and Johnny says, "Well, they want you, but you know uh, I can't pay you that money right now. But I promise you, in six months, I'll 
we'll get it up we'll to what you're out. asking. Yeah. I believed him uh, to be an honest man, and he was an honest man. To the to the to the day, six months later, I got that raise. Nice. So uh, I asked the question. I said, "Well, what about Pete?" And he says, "You don't like his mix." I said, "No, I think he does fine." And it hit me. They're not hiring me to mix. They're just I'd give them a price to both be the audio engineer. Uh. And it hit my head, and I said, "No, man, he does a great job." Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. I kept guy. my mouth shut and kept that money, brother. There you go. <laughs> man, I've got—I don't know if you know—I. Um, so when when I first started uh, hanging around uh, Eddie and Troy with you and with Wix, and uh, it was funny because I mean, me and Wix talked about it all the time. Like, we should just switch buses. I don't know what the fuck we're doing. Like, you're a comedian. I'm a songwriter. You know, I'm trying to be a songwriter. And uh, and um, then once I, I finally got the chance to go out and do some shows, you know, Troy had those light up mic stands. Yeah. Remember those? Yeah. And um, Jeff Greninger built those for him. Goof, yeah. Goofy built those. Goofy. Yeah. And so I called Goofy when we were doing my live record because we were going to do like a DVD with it. And I go, hey, does Troy still have you know, those, those goofy ass light up mic stands? And he goes, yeah, I think, yeah, in storage, I think. And I go, can I borrow one for uh, this DVD with the thing we're going to do? And he's like, yeah, I'll call Troy. I'm sure it's cool, but uh, whatever. So he called Troy. I went and picked it up and then the accident. So I still, I've got Troy's mic stand uh. under the bus. I still, t- I, it's on stage every night. Oh man! And I asked cool. Eddie. I, I played with Eddie uh, a couple months back. Uh, it was six months ago, maybe. And I was like, "Man, I have this mic stand, and I don't know what to do with it. Give it back to." I Goofy think it's in good hands. Give no. it to you. And, no, and he I was like, it, "Man, keep it on the road, man." That's perfect. Good so, answer, Eddie Montgomery. Yeah. So I was pretty honored for that, and, and that Eddie and Troy thing. You start there. Start for a weekend. Turns in. Yeah, the Hillbilly kid. Shoes, they were on their second single. Uh, I forget what the second Hillbilly Shoes had just hit great. Yeah. Uh, Lonely and Gone, I think, was the second yep. single. It was, and, They'll burn that house down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man, and we were all on one bus, and uh, we built a hell of a team there. You know? It was amazing. I hired, uh, I hired Goofy. I hired Goofy from um, uh, Brooks and Dunn. Uh, Baja gave me Goofy. Really? Yeah. He let me take know, Goofy. I hired him as a monitor engineer. I remember. Remember Go- that. Goofy can't mix. <laughs> I re- Goofy knows everything technical about what you should do to mix. Yeah. But something... And, <laughs> and we were on one bus. I really didn't need a production manager yet. Right. But he fixed... Uh, we had all the band from Kentucky. Eddie and Troy brought along their, their band. Guys. Their guys from yeah. Kentucky. Uh, Bo and and uh, Frank are still there. Yep. Andy Andy Bowers was the bass player. Right. Um, uh, somebody else. Oh, Tony Hammonds was playing drums. Yeah. They were Kentucky was Randy boys. Randy Sorrells Randy was, was in there. Yeah. Steel guitar. Yeah, and Gemma wasn't there. They had another acoustic player. Wichita. Yeah, Wichita. Yeah. But um, they had a fiddle player for a minute too. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. But um, uh, Gemma. Was with Montgomery was had auditioned, and they wanted him to go on the road the next weekend. Yeah. He said, "I got to give a two week notice," which I really respect. Yeah, and he held to his guns. He's, he he turned that. They didn't hire him because he said, "I got to give a two week notice." Wow. So when Wichita left, he was the first Jim call. Jimmy got the call. And Jimmy Moniak, for who uh, Robin's talking about, is um, he's he's an incredible guitar player. I mean, a virtuoso, and also three fingers yeah. on his uh, on his playing hand. He's and missing his index finger. Yeah, he was born that way. It, it, he didn't lose it. In he's accident. got like a super finger. Yeah, and then two little <laughs> tiny things. And and the way his hand is You'd set have to up. To talk to his wife about that, I don't have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I asked him one time. I go, uh, I go. Does it? What, what? How do you do that? All that without a pinky, you know, or whatever, whatever the finger. So, and he goes, "Man, a pinky just get in my way." <laughs> <laughs> so then you have so the Montgomery Gentry thing, and you're there. What a decade? Seven years. Seven years. Yeah. And as that goes, and and I've been. Kind I did of, seven years with with Highway 101. I did seven years with Montgomery Gentry. Yeah. And I did seven years with Marshall Tucker. 
I guess I've had this. Uh, uh, what do you call that one? It's like Lucky you, Sevens, man. Lucky Seven or Indentured Servitude. I'm not sure. <laughs> indentured Servitude. I'm not sure what do you call it. Like executive <laughs> Nanny, right? <laughs> I That's mean, the mangler who was Highway 101's first tour manager. The road mangler? The road mangler. From Graham Parsons. From Graham Parsons. He's the guy that burnt Graham. Took Graham stole the body. Stole the body from the L.A. airport. Took it out in the, in the desert. To a Joshua tree, yeah, uh, and burn the body. His body, yeah. And when they, um, and when he they, was Highway 101's first tour manager. Really? Yeah. I didn't know he tour managed after the Graham thing. Yeah. Well, he still he still does Emmy Lou, I think. Does he? Yeah. The road I, mangler. I, we did a show with with the mangler, and I walked into and I had an Emmy Lou hat. I'd gone out and bought one. I actually buy m- music still and yeah. merchandise instead of waiting for somebody to give you something. Right. I walked in. I said, "Hey, can I get this signed?" And Emmy Lou reached up, and I said, "No, him." <laughs> <laughs> that story is crazy. Uh, he had a pact. Him and Graham Parsons had a pact that whoever would die first would take the other's body out and set their soul free by burning their body in the desert. Yeah. And uh, he waited. There's actually a movie about it. Johnny Knoxville's in it called The Grand Theft Parsons, <laughs> and. Um, he went and stole, he rented a hearse, and the guy that owned the hearse rode with him, not knowing what was going on. He told him it was like for his Mima or whatever, you know. He's like, oh, we're just, we're selling coffins or whatever. And he's like, so there's no body in that coffin. No, there's no body in this coffin. We're just picking it up, <laughs> taking it out. And so they steal it, you know, and, and, and they get it out to Joshua Tree, and he pours a bunch of gas in it. Gasoline. Gasoline. Yeah. Throws it on there and it like it is like an explosion, like a whoosh. He goes, shit, I think I used too much on lead it on that thing, you know. <laughs> and then he, uh, his family, obviously, Graham's family was not very happy about it, and uh, they sued him. And I think the only thing he had to do was pay for the coffin because there's no intrinsic value to a body, so he had to reimburse the family for the coffin. <laughs> After burning his best friend in the in the desert, he's still around Nashville. Is he really? Yeah, man. Yeah, I have to meet that guy. Oh, we'll go up. I know where he hangs out. We'll go. Look. Okay, we'll go meet. We got to do it. <laughs> so once you leave uh, the Montgomery Gentry set, um, you are currently on the biggest fucking tour on the planet. Uh, anytime it goes out, you guys are an unbelievable. And I've only just seen a glimpse of it um, when I was with Eddie and Troy uh, opening for them. I was riding. That was an interesting thing as well, just to hit on like your slash story. I would. I was opening for Eddie and Troy. I was riding the crew bus with uh, Eric Matresha, who's <laughs> now the road manager for Joe uh, Diffie. For Joe Diffie. And Robin has spawned all these incredible hard workers from Big Al and uh, Eric and all these guys who've gone on to do these amazing other gigs. And, and, um, and so I was riding the crew bus, which had a, had a distinct smell to it. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, like somebody had washed your pillowcase and some skunk uh, <laughs> paraphernalia. And so I, was riding, I, I would ride the bus, and then, you know, Eddie, like he would do, he'd, you'd be outside the bus or something, and Eddie would be like, hey, hey, let's go to the bar. Mexican. They got margaritas and whiskey all right you know and i was young and so i'm like let's do this so i'd go in drink with eddie and have fun and as the night would progress you know eddie being wild ass as he is he'd be like hey come ride my bus (laughs) you ride with me tonight yeah come fuck the crew bus come ride with me i'd be like okay cool so we got on the bus and we pass the guitar around and sing old songs and drink whiskey and then go to bed and I would roll out of the bunk in the morning. You know, Eddie had a star bus, which is uh, a star bus is, has a full bedroom in the back. It's normally limited bunks, uh, you know, maybe two or three bunks and shower and stuff like that. There's no band on the bus. It's just the artist. And uh, I would roll out of the bunk in the morning and Eddie would normally be sitting up on the couch or whatever and would look at me like... What the fuck are you doing on my How'd bus? How'd you get here? How'd you get here? <laughs> it was always that. I was always like, it's so uncomfortable. So I'd always go up to this driver and go like, hey, are we going to stop anytime soon so I can get back on the crew bus? Because I feel really weird back here. <laughs> but so you leave Eddie and Troy, and you go to work uh, for Kenny Chesney. I did. Yeah. 
And how long have you been? You've been there a long just, time. Now. I just finished my 14th uh, touring season with Kenny. Wow. Yeah. And Kenny was, I mean, were you? Was it an arena tour when you started with Kenny? Were yeah. You, was uh, he doing the stadiums? No, we were doing yet? stadiums. The first show, we, my first show with Kenny was actually in Salt Lake at an amphitheater, and the second show was a stadium uh, really? in Seattle. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. The business you guys are doing, number one, is incredible. Yeah. So, <laughs> how many crew members do you have in the Kenny Chesney? Well, it's, uh, you know. Um, First off, let me say that I'm not a tour manager with Kenny. Right. David Farmer is the one that called me. Correct. There was something that went down with me and a couple of people with Eddie and Troy. And mm. the, it, it was some, wasn't As, any bad blood between us, but something happened and somebody had to um, take leave. A, take a leave. Yeah. yeah. And three days later, David Farmer called and said, hey, me and Kenny's been talking about this. We want you to come out on the road with us the rest of the year and heal. That's the way he put it. Come on out here and heal. And heal? Mm-hmm. Wow. Because they knew I'd been hurt. Yeah. And uh, well, you're, that was 14 tours ago. <laughs> and when you get so close to guy, I mean, you live together, you eat together, you yeah. sleep, you get close very, very quickly. Yeah. You start spending seven years... I mean, you're doing it everything. It was just me and Eddie on a bus. You know? Right. We were, we were the only two. Uh, and you're a brother. You're a confidant. You're sure. a shoulder to cry on. You're the guy that makes sure that everybody that gets, gets what they need. That he, if we're flying out to a gig and I would throw the stuff in the suitcase, you know. Unreal. There was that time I put two left boots in there. That's kind of <laughs> no right boot. <laughs> Did Eddie even notice? Uh, oh, yeah, he knows. <laughs> Troy Gentry loved it. I had to go to the camera guy and say, hey, we're shooting from the waist up today. <laughs> <laughs> so you go out to heal. Yeah, I go out to heal, with, and I'm the assistant tour manager with, with, yeah. with them. So I'm David's assistant is what I am. It's a huge amount of responsibility. I do everything that David doesn't want to fuck with, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Which is... No, I do... I do uh, I do ticketing. I do uh, a lot of the financial things uh, uh, per diem, right. and uh, uh, a lot of things that he just doesn't want to mess with, and right. doesn't have to because it's a big organization. We have uh, average through the years. We've done ten to eleven buses and have about ninety to ninety nine hundred people on the road every year. Uh, we have seventeen semis, so. Automatically, you've got 28 drivers, 11 buses, 17 semis. Um, so that's part of the 90. Believe Automatically. Yeah. Um, but then there's vendors. We use uh, a lighting company. We don't we don't own our own lights. We don't own our own sound. We own right. our stage and our band gear. Right. So everybody else is the vendors. Yeah. Um, we use more uh, lights and sound. Uh, we use a company for video also, and we have a trucking company, and we have a bus company, sure. Hemphill Brothers, upstaging for the trucks. Uh, so about 90 people, but from what I understand, there's the band, there's the crew, there's the production team, yeah. and then there's a few other employees that Kenny still keeps on salary and are at least retainers Right. Um, for, um, it's got to be over 30 people. That wow. he keeps around all the time, and Kenny and David Farmer grew up together. They did, I yeah. think, since third grade or something like right. that. Best friends. David went into banking. They were they were college roommates as well. Really? Uh, yeah, they went off to college together, at East Tennessee. And uh, the the story I get is when uh, De- Kenny started making money instead of owing money to everybody. Right. Because David was in banking, he said, I want you to, to come out here and take care of me. So wow. that's kind of the way I understand it. I don't know if that's true or not, yeah. but that's that's the understanding I have. And David's been on the road, I believe, 21, 22 years now with Kenny. Unreal. Yeah. But, you know, my, my thing with Kenny, Kenny opened for Blackhawk. Uh, and cool. I knew he was a Knoxville boy, and I was born in Knoxville. I automatically had an affinity for that. Yeah. I had, I read, I, I keep up with what's happening. Yeah. Uh, so I knew he was from Knoxville. Plus, the other deal was his first record deal was on Capricorn Records. Yeah. And that was Marshall Tucker Band's making 
making Georgia, right. and Almond Brothers and Wet Willie and uh, all the Southern rock came out of making Georgia. And I just read that Capricorn Studios is opening up uh, this December. Their uh, the studio for tours, really, which would be fascinating. I went through the big wow. house with the Almond Brothers in Macon, Georgia, a couple of years ago. For a friend of mine named Richard that runs the place down there, so he gave me. Actually, I got to hold Dwayne's Gold Top, which just sold for one million dollars. Oh my God! <laughs> I played Can't You See on it. Did you really? I did. <laughs> yeah. That's unreal. Yeah. So uh, that's that story. Yeah. <laughs> so. Hundred people on the road. What yeah, time, something what time, like that. And what, what's your average day look like? Because when I was opening for Eddie and Troy, and we we played the Seattle Quest Stadium yeah. with you guys. Yeah, um, and oh, I that's was right. yeah. I was just there. I wasn't part of the show, but Eddie and Troy were opening, and or one of the openers, Miranda, right. Eddie and Troy. There was a bunch of them, and um, the scale. Of what you guys do out there? Well, is there's the insane. stadiums. The stadiums is a different uh, animal. That on we take 17 semis and all these people into arenas and amphitheaters, right? And we load in at eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah, just like any regular everybody does. Right. Eight a.m. load in. Um, we use local stagehands. Right. For the, all that, and we usually get our stuff packed up within three hours. Unreal. At the end of the night. So the up is how long? Like six hours? Uh, Five hours? No, three or four. Three or four. Wow. Yeah. I mean, we're the ready, we're ready to quicker, do a sound yeah. check by two two p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, with, so six hours. But we take. You have to give union breaks. You have to do breakfast. We have to do lunch. Right. Um, they're ready by noon every day. Yeah, sure. But um, and then the stadiums is a different animal. Um, that's about a seven day full week to do a stadium we're not paying overtime usually especially if you load in on a sunday you've got time and a half automatically right so uh you do a load in sunday you work an eight hour ten hour day whatever it is before you hit overtime you come back in you do the terraplast over the field you come back in on monday you build the steel and then we come in the day before the show doors are at four o'clock we bring the three acts in on Saturday morning on the on show day on the stadium, uh, but we load in on Fridays, get everything up, whammy jammy, and turn up the lights and the music and party in a dang stadium on oh Friday night. Oh my gosh! Which you guys just <laughs> announced a huge stadium tour. We're going to do 19 next year. We've done, I believe, it's 146 stadium shows so far. That's unbelievable! Yeah. Unbelievable! Yeah. Including selling out Boston twice. Oh, we sell out Boston. I think we've done, I don't know how many sellouts we've done. but No, but I mean like two nights in a row. Oh, yeah, yeah. We do. Uh, we just added a second show in Boston next year. Uh, Kenny just announced it two days ago, I believe. We, the first one sold out, so we added a second show in Boston. <laughs> I mean, huge. Like, I, you look at acts that are like selling two nights in an arena where you're like, wow. That's that's some. I mean, it's about one hundred twenty thousand tickets, one hundred nineteen thousand tickets. That's un- unbelievable. Yeah, absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. And so, for people like I guess what we normally talk about the podcast is being too dumb to quit, which has been my mentor, <laughs> my my uh, not mentor, <laughs> my uh, mantra. It's just too dumb to quit. Stick around. What when you? What are some of the things that you would tell somebody? trying to get into this shit right now of man you know my friend david carr that that i met back in college we sit around and smoked weed yeah i mean we were we were friends from that point of view first i'm enthralled because he's in a band uh, that I knew of, and he's my home. He's a hometown cat, and he's in this national band. The only other person that I knew at that time, uh, Billy Earhart, uh, Billy E, played uh, keyboards for Amazing Rhythm Maces, mm. and then he played keyboards for uh, Hank Jr. for 20 years. Wow! But he was in the Amazing Rhythm Maces, and they had just hit Third Rate Romance, and now David comes along. And uh, we were sitting around uh, my house one night, and he looked at my book of poems. I was, uh, I was in college, and I, uh, you know, in in high school, my English grades were D's and F's 
except during the six weeks that we did poetry and I'd get A's and B's. <laughs> right. So he looked at my, my book of poems and he says, man, you're not a poet, you're a songwriter. This yeah. is iambic pentameter. And I said, well, what's <laughs> iambic pentameter? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's kind of where the whole thing started. Him and I started, uh, you know, I blew harmonica. Yeah. And uh, we, we would jam and just the music when I was offered the opportunity to quit college and go to work for a band that didn't have any gigs and never had any more gigs. Right. <laughs> right. I, I took the opportunity. Three months later, I was on the road with Marshall Tucker Band. It's crazy. Can that happen these days? No, I don't I, think so. I don't know, man. Maybe. I don't Maybe. know. You know, I think that there's always these special kind of anomalies, you know. I think that um, there's some people out there that are so I was too I was too dumb not to know not to take the, to quit college. Right. <laughs> I was too dumb not to go back to college. Right. <laughs> when I realized that Rich Mountain Tower was not going to get back together. But if you but if any of those dominoes fall a different way, your life is totally different. Totally. Totally. If you don't different. take that leap, you know, of you know I'm gonna, I'm going to do this and I'm going to Yeah. I think that you know you can fail being a fucking accountant i think it's worth trying you know um yeah there's there's probably one girl out there that thinks i've gotten the music business because her daddy was in it and she broke up with me <laughs> <laughs> which is another true story i dated charlie daniel's bus driver's daughter really in 1974 and she's never spoken with me since <laughs> but i think she still thinks around i was charlie stalking Drew. her <laughs> That is a piece of advice. I mean, you take something away from everybody you work with, everybody you fall in love with on the road when it comes to artists and, and brothers of the highway. And what what are some of the 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 things that people told you along the way? You know, I know, you know, you kinda had like these hillbilly huck fins out there of like Tommy Caldwell. You know, you've told me some of the knowledge. Not just, not just those guys. It was Moon Mullins, and it was uh, Ben Burnett, and it was Steve Shropshire. Yeah. And it was... Uh, what would they tell you? Ronnie Ware. What were the things? Ron's dad. Right. Yeah, Rhino. Uh, that was Stump, Moon, Puff, Mojo. We all had nicknames because we had to have right. aliases <laughs> during those times. Uh, but those guys are the ones that took me under their wing. Yeah. And Tommy Caldwell and Doug Gray and yeah. and, and Toy Caldwell and Paul Riddle. Paul Riddle used to tell me that when I first started mixing, he said, man, this sounds like a, my living room. He called his mix his living room. Yeah. Well, how does that help a, a young kid's ego? It just pushed me to be better and do better for them every night. Exactly. Uh, and... You know, we called Paul earlier today before we started this this talk. And uh, two weeks ago, Moon Mullins still lives in Spartanburg, South Carolina. They all still live in Spartanburg. And uh, every it used to be every five years, we would have a Marshall Tucker Band road crew reunion. Right. And we just had one two weeks ago. And we all still get together, and we all pick up right where we left off. Yeah. And that's the way... I have found that all of us gypsies, uh, uh, troubadours, wandering minstrels, yeah. that's the way we all act. Yeah. When we First, we're drawn to the music and uh, the good times and the sad times in music. Sure. I mean, you can live all your emotions through music. Mm -hmm. And our lives just pick right back up with everybody I've ever been. And the team that we had with Marshall Tucker Band, and when I became a tour manager, that's the same way I govern. I want to build those teams yeah. with family yep. and values. And uh, I, think I've, I think I've done a good job. I think you've done a hell of a job. Sticking to the formula. Yeah. So Everyone who knows you loves you. Everyone. <laughs> it's incredible. Not that chick that I dated. <laughs> Except for the 74. Hey, one out of like fucking 20,000 is not bad. <laughs> that is not a bad ratio. Mine is way different. <laughs> no, it's just, I, I love this industry and I, I'm, I'm too dumb to quit. Too dumb to quit. Yeah. Well, dude, 
the stuff that you've gone through on the road, you know, you had a liver transplant. I did. We killed a liver along the killed way. Killed a liver along the way. I had hep C. And, yeah. And uh, didn't know it, and they found out I had hep C for more than, probably more than 30 years when they found the hep C. So I had so much scar damage uh, on my liver, uh, which is the definition of cirrhosis. Yeah. It's it's not drinking. It's uh, scar tissue is what right. that is. And um, it was, uh, we, I, it was inoperable. So my only thing that I could have done was get a liver transplant. Right. And the grace of God, uh, everybody in the music industry came to, to my aid. Uh, they threw a benefit for me, and 17 different acts showed up to play music that night. Amazing. And everybody I'd, I had worked for, uh, Henry Paul with Blackhawk was instrumental in putting it together. Stormy Warren was the other person instrumental in putting it together. And a friend of mine named Brian Cruz out of North Carolina, promoter and now a manager, uh, he was the third one that helped put this thing together. Yeah. And Casey Musgraves and uh, just all kinds of people showed up. Paulette came from Highway 101 and Jack Daniels and uh, all the Marshall Tucker crew drove over and uh, uh, 38 Special, Mark was there. Mark Rogers uh, had sent something, and they all sent something to make money, and uh, John Barry came and performed, and uh, damn. Well, you have served so many kindnesses to so many people. Um, that you, You've you always gone out of your way. The, the, the greats, and and that's why, I, like Pootie, um, who we were talking about earlier with Willie Nelson, Pootie would make... A, a guy from North Idaho who does deserves zero attention to feel like a rock star <laughs> every time you showed up at a Willie Nelson show or and you were the same way you treated people with kindness from top to bottom whether they were uh, the headliner or the opener or some punk ass kid we'll give you enough rope it's a, right <laughs> <laughs> but you can hang yourself <laughs> you, were the, you were the definition of perseverance it's and I'm a hard ass and you know it it's firm but fair firm but fair and you treat people like you want to be treated yeah I, I believe in and that and you have still. no ego that's the other thing I love about it don't tell my wife that <laughs> Misty will differ with you. (laughs) (laughs) But I think that's just such an important part of it when, you know, uh, kind of another thing that I've been trying to practice is to to be less and do more. It doesn't Mm. matter where the credit lands. That's true. In instances. And you've done a lot of that. You've done a lot of other people's work uh, throughout your career. And, And that's what we've got with Kenny right now. We've got a team. Yes. I, I, I'm kind of the low man on the totem pole at, at 14 summers with him. Wow. Uh, you know, Ed, Mc, Ed Wanabo, the production manager, has been with Kenny 20 years now, 19 years or something like that. Mm. Jill, the production assistant, has been there 16 or 17. Farmer's been there 21. The band's all been there. Yeah, they're all pretty much all the same band guys. Well, we've got a new bass player and uh, a couple of new guitar players since I've been there. But gosh, we've got Kenny Greenberg playing, and John uh, Connolly is out with us now. And we've got this new female bass player. That I think this is her fourth or fifth year. Harmony McCarty, killer bass player. Really? Yeah. So uh, I can't wait to see one of the shows. Oh man, we're going to do a bunch of them next year. I'm okay. I think we're doing about forty something shows next year, or something like that. Well, if you need somebody to play in the parking lot, I'm your guy. <laughs> <laughs> Louis Messina, did you hear that? <laughs> Well, man, thank you for the time. Oh, I brother. would rather sit I'm here honored. and talk for nine hours because your journey is amazing. We've lost a lot of people already. It's you amazing. know that. No, hell no. Whoever hung the whole time, thanks. <laughs> Robin Majors, friends and neighbors. I love you, brother. I love you too, man. Go see Jeremy McComb live. Oh. I haven't seen him for a while, and I can't wait to see you soon. Wow. Thank you, man. Love, love you. Love you, dude.